What do you call it when a revolution has a revolution? In this video, we're going to look at one of the most important moments in the history of the French Revolution, the Second Revolution, when the people of Paris overthrew the very government that their first actions in 1789 had helped to set up. All right, let's get going. For this video, you're going to need something to take notes with and one primary source, the petition of the Parisian sections from August 1792. Like the last petition you led from the Cordelier Club, this one is pretty fiery. We're going to start our story back in time a little bit. If you can remember from last video, the last year of the revolution, spanning from like 1791 to 1792, was a pretty tumultuous one. From the flight of the king, to the, the establishment of the new regime and the new legislative assembly, to the declaration of war, a lot had changed in France over the past year. There's a context here that is important to consider when trying to understand just when, what went down in the summer of 1792. First, we have to look at the role of the king in the new regime that had been set up and what the king had been doing since his failed flight in the summer of 1791. Remember that much to the chagrin of many radicals, the king had been given the right to a suspensive veto of legislation passed in the assembly. After the opening of the new regime in October 1791, the king used his veto on two very notable occasions. The first was on the émigré bill, passed on November 9, 1791, that required all émigrés to return to France by the new year lest they forfeit their property and be convicted of treason. The second was the bill against refractory priests, passed in the same month. So, in the first three months of the new regime, and less than a half a year removed from his flight, the king had gone to bat for émigrés and refractory priests, and officially contradicted the will of the new assembly. This was a bad start for a king trying to rehabilitate his image after attempting to flee the country. A few months later, France went to war, and once again the king's loyalties were called into question. Some suspected right away that the king's loyalties might not be with the nation. Robespierre feared as much when he spoke out against the motion to go to war. Suspicions were once again revived when the commander of the Prussian armies that were invading France in the summer of 1792 sent a letter to the people of Paris in which he not only threatened the city with destruction, but also tied his campaign to the goal of securing the safety of Louis XVI and his family. The Brunswick Manifesto, as it was called, was very shocking. It was so shocking, in fact, that I feel like I have to show you uh, just for you to understand it yourselves. Here's part of the Brunswick uh, Manifesto, and here's how it read. The goal of the war, he essentially set up, is to have the anarchy within France cease, to stop the attacks being made on the throne and the altar, to re-establish legal power, to return to the king the safety and freedom of which he is deprived, and to place him in a position to exercise the legitimate authority which is his due. It is with this in view that I, the Duke of Brunswick, declare, and then it follows a few paragraphs later, the city of Paris and all its inhabitants, without distinction, will be obliged to submit themselves to the king, to give this prince full and complete freedom, and to guarantee for him the inviolability and the respect which the right of nature and of men obliges from subjects towards sovereigns. Their, royal, their imperial and royal majesties, that's the king of Prussia and the emperor of Austria, make personally responsible for all events to be punished militarily all members of the National Assembly, of the District, of the Municipality, and of the National Guard of Paris, that if the least outrage to their majesties the King, I'm talking about here the King and Queen of France, and the Royal Family, if their safety, their, their preservation, excuse me, that's a typo, and their freedom are not immediately provided for, they will wreak an exemplary and forever memorable vengeance by delivering up the city of Paris to a military execution and total destruction. Oh, 
Imagine what it must have felt like to be a Parisian receiving this letter in late June 1792. You already knew that the war was going poorly and that invading armies were nearing Paris, and then you get this letter. They must have felt terrified, but also infuriated that the person bent on destroying Paris was doing so, apparently, on behalf of their king. In the meantime, the war was going really, really poorly. And if you can remember, the assembly finally made a decree that the nation was, quote, in danger. The decree called French citizens to volunteer to fight, but it also did a few other things that would have a big impact in the events of the summer. First, it placed sectional assemblies into permanent session. This meant that the sections would continue to meet. And by summer 1792, many of these sections in Paris had been taken over by some of the most radical members of the Parisian populace. Once in permanent session, moreover, the sections not only worked to recruit people for the army, but also began deliberating over political matters. Sectional assemblies became kind of like clubs, where people discussed issues and planned political actions. Finally, the La Patrie en Danger decree also armed the populace. It provided members of the, pop of the public with pikes that could be used against invading armies. These changes made the Parisian public more powerful than ever before. Consequently, Parisians began exerting even more force over, over the political process. In particular, people began speaking more and more about the power of the sans-culotte. Sans-culotte was a term generally referring to working class people in France. It emerged out of the type of clothing that workers tended to wear, as opposed to the sort of knee breeches and silk stockings of the nobility and those with money. The sans-culotte wore pants, sans-culotte meaning without culottes. Sansculat were artisans and urban laborers, and many of them were active participants in the revolutionary clubs, especially the Jacobin and Cordelier clubs. They comprised the majority of the crowd that was at the Champ de Mars, for example, on the day of the massacre at the Champ de Mars. And it was the Sansculat who now, because of the situation of the war and the La Patrie en Danger decree, began to have a bit more access to the political process. They began attending sectional meetings. They, they poured into the National Guard, newly opened for them and they began organizing their own demonstrations. On June 20th, 1792, for example, a group of Parisian sans marched to the Tuileries Palace and planted a liberty tree in the courtyard, and then made demands that the king give up his right to the veto. The Parisian sans were becoming increasingly influential, and the moment of anxiety produced by the situation in the summer of 1792 meant that they had an opportunity to make a change. Things were getting tense in the summer of 1792, the war was going poorly, the Parisian crowd was getting rowdy, and people were beginning to fear that the entire revolutionary project might collapse. This is when the Parisian sans culottes saw an opportunity to push for further change. So in order to look at this more closely, I want you to pause this video and take a look at the primary source that I told you about at the beginning of the video, the petition from the Parisian sections. This is going to give you a little bit of insight into what the Parisian sans culottes wanted. This is a rich document. It tells us a lot. But I want to point out one paragraph that I think is particularly important. Here's what the petition said. The chief of the executive power is the key link in the counter-revolutionary chain. He seems to participate in the plots of Pilnitz, which he has so tardily made known. Every day his name is in conflict with that of the nation and has become a signal for discord between the people and its magistrates, between the soldiers and their generals. He has separated his interests from those of the nation, and we too separate them. Far from having opposed the enemies without and within by any formal act, his conduct is a perpetual and formal act of disobedience to the Constitution. As long as we have such a king, freedom cannot grow strong, and we want to be free. The sections once again bring up the association of Louis XVI with counter-revolution. They link him to the Declaration of Pilnitz and say that his interests have consistently been different from the nation's interests. And so, ultimately, the point of the petition is to call for Louis' suspension from powers, just as the petition of the Cordelier Club had called for the removal of the king months before. This petition asks for the, removal, uh, the king's removal from the mechanisms of power, officially and formally. The situation boiled over a few days later. What occurred was what historians have come to call the Second Revolution in France, when the Parisian sans-culottes overpowered the Legislative Assembly and took control of the government in France. 
To tell this story, we're going to turn to our old friend, Traveler Watkins. Traveler, where are you and what do you know? Hey everyone, I'm here at the Place de Concorde in Paris, on the right bank of Paris. And this is arguably, uh, if I had to choose, uh, this is arguably the, the most important spot for the history of the revolution in the entire city of Paris. And that's because you can sort of tell the entire story of the revolution from this spot. Uh, for example, if you look sort of in front of me over here, right? The bridge that's right over there that those cars were driving over uh, was made actually by, uh, with the, the stones from the Bastille. Uh, after the storming of the Bastille, they actually dragged the stones all the way over here, uh, west to, to sort of the center of the city, and, uh, and used them to create that bridge. Behind me, this building right here, was the building that was used uh, as the, the home of the National, uh, or the National Assembly and the Legislative Assembly and the Convention. Uh, after they moved from Versailles to Paris in 1789. If you look over this way, all the way over here, if you see those trees there, that is the beginning of the Tuileries Garden. The Tuileries Garden is the garden that is right in front of the Louvre, the palace uh, that was the King's Palace, the Royal Palace in the middle of Paris. Then finally, and probably most significantly, uh, the Place de Concorde was not always called the Place de Concorde. It was, uh, during the Revolution, known as the Place de la Révolution. And the reason is because this was the sort of revolutionary square where the, the state guillotine was set up. And so during the Terror, when they did state executions, uh, public executions, they happened here, at the Place de Concorde, a.k.a. the Place de la Révolution. But the event that sort of ties all of these things together is one of the most significant, uh, what historians call the Journée, or, or days of the revolution. And that was the day of August 10th, 1792. August 10th, 1792 was a day that began uh, what, what historians refer to as the second revolution, a major turning point in the history of the revolution. And the story of August 10th is really, uh, it really comes out of the context of uh, the growing power of the sections and the sectional assemblies in Paris and the sans culottes in Paris in the year er, in the months following uh, the flight of the king. Um, after the flight of the king, sectional assemblies were calling for the, the for the king to be deposed, right, to be uh, uh, taken out of his position of power, and they actually petitioned the national assembly on August sixth. To, to remove the king, a petition that was uh, subsequently ignored by the National Assembly, by the Legislative Assembly. Um, it, was, it was this kind of context, right, this, this consistent push from sans culottes in Paris that sort of set up this, this context. A few days later, after August the 6th, on August the 8th, uh, sans culottes, led by Danton, uh, Georges Danton, actually led a raid on the municipal government in, in Paris, uh, took it over and set up their own municipal government, what they called the Insurrectionary Commune. And the Commune sort of uh, organized on August 10th a massive demonstration, a protest of Parisians against the king specifically. And that protest went all the way to the Tuileries Garden and to the Louvre, just to my left, right there. 20,000 Parisians came to protest against the king. And uh, the royal family was so scared, right, by this protest, they were so scared by this popular movement, that they actually fled across the Tuileries Garden to the building right behind me, uh, which was where the Legislative Assembly was, was meeting. And the crowd of 20,000 crying out for the king eventually made their way into the courtyard of the Louvre, where they uh, came into conflict with members of the Swiss Guard, the, the royal guard that was there to protect the king and the queen. Um, eventually, this conflict sort of led to actual violence. Uh, the way the story goes, one of the Swiss Guard actually approached one of the members of the mob uh, uh, the, the, the person in the crowd actually pulled out a knife um, and stabbed the member of the Swiss Guard, and then the Swiss Guard subsequently shot into the crowd. This created total chaos. The crowd stormed the Louvre, uh, going all through it, ransacking the place, uh, stealing stuff, destroying stuff, and searching for the royal family. When they found out that the royal family wasn't there, they went to the Legislative Assembly, where they found the royal family and all the legislators there in session. And uh, at, at sort of knife point, as it were, at gunpoint, the sans-culottes actually demanded 
that, uh, that the legislative assembly deposed the king, as they had requested days before, and that the king and the whole royal family be thrown into prison. So by the end of the day, on August 10th, a demonstration uh, had turned into a revolution, right? The king had been arrested, thrown into jail, dragged into the jail of the Temple in the, in the north side of the city, and the government became uh, de facto sort of a, a monarch-less state. This is the beginning of the French Republic, right? The first uh, non-monarchical government in French history. And it's the, uh, a turning point in the history of the revolution because it led to a progressive radicalization here in Paris, where the sans and their allies uh, in the convention started to, started to take more and more power of the whole state of France. And that caused a whole litany of, of events and had a whole litany of consequences uh, in the months and years to follow. The events of August 10th, 1792 initiated a second revolution. And this revolution was led very much by the Parisian sans culottes and those at their head, including revolutionary leaders like Danton and Desmoulins and Robespierre. These people initiated a totally new change. They brought France from where it was in the first years of the revolution to something very, very new. They brought France into an era of a republic. The events of August 10th, 1792 revealed one very important thing. The Legislative Assembly, and indeed the entire French government, was very much at the mercy of the Parisian crowd. Those who controlled the crowd, and really that meant those who controlled the sections, had the real mechanism of political will in France. And so it was that the leaders of the sections became those people who ascended to prominence, and their agenda was often that of the Parisian sec sections themselves. Perhaps the best example of this was the decree that the National Assembly made on August 10th in the wake of the assault on the Tuileries. The assembly, first, officially suspended the king from his powers. Then it made an even more bold declaration. The assembly called for a new national convention to be formed and tasked with rewriting the constitution. The intent, of course, was to rewrite the constitution not only so that it placed the king outside of the purview of the government, but also to write it in a way that now officially included those sans culottes and others who had been excluded from the mechanisms of power previously those declared passive citizens under the first constitution. The sections pushed the assembly to once again remake the French state. The new ideals of the sections were put into place almost immediately. New ministers were elected to positions of prominence, and the heroes of the sections were among those selected. Danton, for example, became the new minister of justice for all of France. The assembly also held elections for the new convention, and the elections were open to all adult males, regardless of property or wealth. The new ministry, moreover, began to pursue pretty radical policies right from the get-go in this moment of high anxiety and turmoil. Danton decreed that no one was allowed to leave the capital without a passport, and passports could only be issued to those who had obtained certificates of citizenship from their sectional assemblies. Danton also began a policy of domiciliary visits, in which members of the National Guard had permission to raid homes to look for evidence of counter-revolution and treasonous behavior. The visits produced some 3,000 arrests by the beginning of September, thus adding to the already increasing prison population that eventually became the victims of the September massacres. Only a few weeks later, the new convention proclaimed that the new government that they were going to establish would indeed be a republic. And as requested by the sections, the new convention declared that they would start from scratch with a new constitution. The first French constitution lasted all of a year. In the meantime, the convention also declared that it would be the only sovereign political body in France. All power would be vested in the convention without any checks or balances drawn up to prevent it from accomplishing its goals. Yet in the action that was perhaps most connected to the agenda of the sections, the National Convention also decided that they would put Louis XVI on trial for crimes against the nation. On December 11, 1792, the king was brought from the prison of the Temple to the halls of the National Convention and officially indicted by the new assembly. The trial eventually began on December 26th, the day after Christmas, 1792, and it proceeded for a few weeks. 
King's lawyers attempted to paint him as a victim of circumstances, the un unwitting participant in tragic events, but the case against Louis was simply too big. The prosecutors used as evidence his letters and correspondence, including the letter that he left behind on the day that he and his family had fled the capital. When the convention took a vote, the verdict was decisive. Guilty. The convention then deliberated over the proper punishment. Some wanted a life imprisonment. Others recommended the death penalty. And once again, when put to a vote on January 17, 1793, those in favor of capital punishment won out. The former king of France was slated to be put to death. The fateful day came on January 21st, 1793, and perhaps the best way to finish this story is simply to relay the events as told by a contemporary newspaper of the time, The Moniteur. Here's how The Moniteur portrayed the events of the day. Monday, January 21st, was the day set for the carrying out of the death decree pronounced against Louis Capet. Hardly had the proclamation of the Provincial Executive Council been made known to him than he asked to speak to his family. His wife, his children, and his sister came to see him. They conferred together in the room where it was his custom to eat. The interview took two and a half hours. His family had begged him to allow them to see him in the morning, but he dealt with this question by answering neither yes nor no. Madame, referring to the Queen, did not see him again. The Major General and the Commissioners of the Commune went at half past eight in the morning the next day into the apartment where Louis Capet was. The Major made known to him the order he had just received to take him to the execution. Louis asked for three minutes to speak to his confessor, which was granted him. The procession followed the boulevards to the place of execution. A great silence held sway along the entire way. Louis read the prayers of the dying, and he arrived at the Place de la Révolution at ten past ten. He undressed, climbed up confidently, and walking to the extreme left-hand side of the scaffold, he said in quite a firm voice, Men of France, I die innocent. I forgive all my enemies, and I wish that my death be useful to the people. He seemed to want to say more, but the Major General ordered the executioner to do his duty. Louis's head fell at 10.20 in the morning. It was shown to the people, and immediately a thousand cries of Long live the nation! Long live the French Republic were heard. The body was taken away at once and left at the Madeleine Church, where it was buried between the people who had died on the day of his wedding and the Swiss nationals who were massacred on the 10th of August. Two hours later, nothing in Paris showed that he who once was the head of the nation had just suffered a criminal's execution. The public peace was not disturbed for a moment. But let us leave Louis. From now on, he belongs to history. There is something sacred for the moral and sensitive man and a victim of the law. All good citizens must turn their wishes, their talents, and their strengths toward the future. And so officially ended the old regime. There was no turning back now. French revolutionaries had finally removed the last vestige of their monarchical past. In the next lesson, we're going to look at the fallout from this momentous action. But until then, good job, good luck, see you in class.